the anointing, part two. And I'm going to be speaking about the value, the value of the anointing. Um, how many of you know that uh, whatever it is that you value is what you pursue? Amen? Whatever you value, you will pursue. You, you would, you'll want it. And um, many of us, at one time, we were babes in life, right? I can tell you right now that many of us are probably in pursuit of success, pursuit of, you know, finances, pursuit of these things. But when we were babes, we didn't, we weren't in pursuit of that. We were in pursuit of our, the attention of our mother and father. Amen? I know my grandson, he's in pursuit of Momo. Come on, somebody. He's in pursuit. That's his desire is to find Momo every Sunday, go over there, grab her hand, and say, when are we leaving? That's his, that's his pursuit. You know, that's what he values. He values his time with her. Whatever you value is what you will pursue. And, and I want, that's why I really want to, to look at this because when you value the anointing of God on your life, you will pursue it. All right? When, when you don't value the anointing, um, then you won't go after it. And, and like I said last week, if you think that you got the gifts, come on, somebody. When you got the gifts, I'm good at this. I know it. They don't, people don't really spend time in, in that place where, where the anointing is cultivated. Because you got the gift. And, and you know, you're a pretty good speaker or you're, you're, you're pretty good, you know, uh, um, you know you, you're smart, you know, you're, you're intellectual. You know, I, I, can do, I don't need to pray as much as so-and-so because I got the gifts. And you, you, and you ignore or, or, or put off that anointing. And, and so many, so many churches so many preachers so many pastors so many evangelists all the you know they 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 do their job without being anointed how many of you know that that, that Saul was anointed but he lost it he was still in the job but he was no longer anointed to do it some people are still in their place and they're not they haven't been anointed to do it anymore God had already anointed someone else to take Saul's place, but, but, but Saul was still on the job. And he was having a horrible time. So it's important, it's important to value the anointing. When you value the anointing, then we have to learn how to keep that anointing on our lives. But, you know, that's another message. Okay, that's another message. I just really, I want you to grasp that, you know, uh, if, if there's a dead church, then there's a dead pastor spiritually. All right? If there is so, dis, just so much dysfunction in a home, then there's a dead pastor there too that ain't taking his, his job. Fathers are anointed. Mothers are anointed. Pastors are anointed. We're all anointed to do our jobs. Amen? God has anointed us to do what he's called us to do. You, you were not just uh, happen to be a man or a woman. God anointed you to be that man, to be that protector, to be that provider, to be all of those things. He anointed you for that. And, and so many times we neglect or don't value our calling. Why is there absent fathers in the home? Because... They value something else they run after. They pursue something else. They pursue the corporate ladder. Or, you know, I mean, we, you know, me and my wife, we've always laid ourselves on the, on the grill, amen, like a good slab of fajitas. I'm just talking about fajitas this morning. But, I mean, you know, there was a time in our life we, we, didn't, we didn't value the things of God. We valued our own personal lives. We pursued the things that we wanted to pursue. We wanted to go out. We wanted to have fun. We wanted to pleasure ourselves. So what if we had three kids? Value your pursuit of happiness. Some people call it, um, you, you know, with your job or with your business or with whatever it is. 
You know, and, and, and God has anointed us to, to, he set us in place to where he wanted to. So that's, I really want to speak to you about that, you know, because we have to put things into perspective, amen? And, and when we value the things we're supposed to, then, then we have that power and that presence of God. Um, whatever, that's what, whatever you value, you will pursue. What are you in pursuit of? Or what do you value? Where do you spend most of your time at? You know, the majority of your time, where does it go? Your mornings. Who do you give them to? Because when you say yes to someone, you're saying no to someone else. All right? So who you have, you're going to remember, when, when, when you have your priorities in line, and you, if I ask you right now, what is your number one priority? What do you get up in the morning to do? What, what do you have to do? Some people will say, well, I got to get that cup of coffee. <laughs> Some people will say, you know, well, I, I got to get up, and I, I got to get up real fast. I got to get ready to go to work. What is, what is your pursuit? What do you go after? And, and you know, I, I, want, I, I, want, um, I want you to know that when you put the anointing first, when you put what your, God's purposes and plans for your life, when you put that first, Come on. man, you'll be in a great place. You know, when you, many of us have, uh, when we've grown up, we, we figured out, well, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be this. So we, we pursued a degree, right? Maybe some of you are single and you say, I want to get married. You pursued that man or that woman. You pursued it. So every one of those things takes a process. So the anointing, there's a process too. There's a process. Now there were certain cases, okay, there, was, there were these Nazarites, as they call them in the Bible. There were some Nazarites in the Bible. They were born with, their, with the anointing, okay. Samson was a Nazarite. He was born with the anointing, all right. He didn't go through the process. But he lost it. All right? You got to be careful. Some people start off great. They start off good. And they lose it. John the Baptist, when the presence of God came in with Mary, Elizabeth, the Bible says, it leaped in her womb. Boom. That, the anointing came on John the Baptist. He had a purpose. He had a plan. Right from the beginning. Some people have to, like Saul, the king, the first king of Saul, he had to go and he, he found the, the anointing, the the they anointed him. David too. Samuel went and he found him. He anointed him. All right? You don't find God. God finds you. All right? And so every one of you, you're here today because God saw you. He called you. He brought you. And he wants to anoint you. Everything that you, everything in life is not an accident. It's for a purpose. So... Real quick, um, there's a process of how to activate your anointing, and that's what I want to get to. Three ways to activate your anointing. Amen? How many of you brought a pen and paper? Those are the anointed ones right there. Those are the anointed ones. Amen? They got a pen and they got a paper. They are ready because I want to, I want to know the process. I want to be activated. There's going to be more on this series of the anointing because it's just so powerful how we, we take it lightly, church. We take it lightly, the things that God has called us to do. We take it lightly in, in, our, in our calling. We, we think that, um, you know, we think that we don't have to pray anymore. You know, there's only one thing that the disciples asked Jesus it was only one thing. You know what they asked Jesus? Teach us how to pray. They never asked Jesus, teach us how to speak. They never said, hey, Lord, teach us how to cast out these devils. They, they never said, Lord, teach us how to prophesy. They just said, they told, they told Christ, teach us how to pray. Why? Because when Jesus would perform a miracle, he would say, Father, I know you hear me. I know you always hear me. And Father, I mean, you know, when he spoke, heaven opened and heaven came down. They saw that anointing. When he got baptized, they saw heaven open and they saw the, the Spirit of God come down. When he prayed, 
things happen. And that's why the disciples, good disciples, they'll ask you. Good disciples will say, how do you do that? I want to know. I want to learn. A good student always asks questions. Have you ever heard that? A good student will always ask questions. The ones that don't say nothing, they're not even writing it down. No, I got it all in here. No wonder. <laughs> Three ways to activate the anointing. Amen. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, <laughs> so the first, the number one thing to, to, to activate the anointing is honor the anointing. Amen. Thank you for those two amens. Bless God. Thank you for them two amens. Amen. This is the thing. You, you can write these things down. Whatever you honor, you'll attract. Whomever you honor, you will attract. When you don't honor the anointing, you won't receive an anointing. You know, if you don't honor the anointing of God on your life, neither will God or people. There's an anointing of God on your life, but you don't honor it. There's an anointing of God on your life. God has called you. He might have called you to preach. He may have called you to worship. He may have called you to serve. He may have called you to be a, a businessman for, uh, you know, to fund the kingdom of God. He may have called you. I mean, some of you, you, you make money in your sleep. That's how good you are. That's an anointing on your life. But so many times, how many, how many people you have heard singing, and they're singing in the secular world, they haven't, anoint, they haven't honored the anointing that God has put on their life for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? If you don't honor the anointing of God on your life, neither will God or people. People won't honor your anointing if you don't honor your anointing. Amen? What, you know, you know the, if I'm a pastor... And I work with somebody, and I, go, and I go to work, and I just begin to cuss like a sailor. Do you think they're going to honor that anointing? You know, how many of you have been around people, they know you're a Christian, so when they cuss, they say, oh, I'm sorry about that. Excuse my language. Pretty soon when you start to cuss with them, they don't say that anymore. Yeah. What? He cusses worse, is worse than I do. You know, it's just, it's about honoring your anointing, honoring your testimony, honoring what God is doing in you and through you. Amen? Are you too busy for the anointing? Some, some, you know, when, when you don't, and this is the thing, we can get too busy with our jobs, we can get too busy with other priorities, we can get too busy. Some husbands get too busy for their wives. They don't honor their wife. How do you honor your wife? If you ask your wife, how do you honor, how do I honor you, honey? She's going to say, spend time with me. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. Thank you for those two claps. All the ladies should have said amen. 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 All the ladies should have said amen. And this is the thing. The proof of love is the investment of time. The proof of love is the investment of time. How many of you are grandparents? Amen. I know my, you know, when we go visit our parents, we go over there. Here, Dad. Yeah, Mom, I brought you this turn. All right. I'll see you later. <laughs> Gotta go. Gotta go. Hey, sit down. You know, why don't this talk? Come on. What are y'all in a hurry for? You're in and you're out. You think they feel loved? Mm. Come on. Man, that is a tough message, I guess. I mean, <laughs> who's smiling? I'm going to gravitate towards the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you can get too busy, you know? God has anointed you for something. You know, let me tell you, and I, I'm, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. When, when you get too busy, you know, you, you, you miss it. You know, the anointing, the, God, the anointing of God shows you things. It lets you hear things. It lets you see things. And you get too busy. You know, take time. Make it a priority. All true ministry stems from intimacy. Intimacy is where the anointing is cultivated. Intimacy is, intimacy is where the, the anointing is cultivated. All right? And this is the thing. It's just like, it's just like, it's like us praying for our kids, right? When people come and they want to pray for this child and that child, or they want to pray for their marriage, and you ask them, have you prayed for it? No, I'm too busy. How is it that you want? If, you, if, you're, not, if you're serious about your, your, your children or your marriage uh, turning around, pray for it. Spend time in the intimacy. 
God will, God will show God will show up in things, you know. But, you know, the main thing today, the main point of this is that I want you to understand how God values the anointing that he put on your life. When God anoints you on your life, he anointed you for a purpose. He set you apart. He, he wants you to do something. Amen? Amen? And so I want to show you today, these are some of the scriptures. Okay, this is 1 Samuel, I mean, yes, chapter 2, verse 30. It says, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed. That your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. What happened here? This was a prophet. His name was Eli. Eli, he, he had told them he was, he was from the house of Levi. The priest, the priestly tribe. And so he always told him, look, I'm going to be with you forever. I'm going to extend your, your, uh, your, your family line. But because he didn't honor God, instead he honored his, his, his sons, what they were doing, instead of what God wanted him to do, he says, far be it from me. He said, because you haven't took the anointing that I put on your life, you haven't taken it serious, you haven't valued it, you haven't pursued it. He says, I'm not going to honor you anymore. Eli lost the anointing. Saul lost the anointing. Look in Romans. This is New Testament. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. He says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they knew God. See, God is not talking to people that are out there that don't know him. We know God. We, we, we've received from God. We've tasted the goodness of God. You know, when people are out there and, and, and there's, they don't know God. They have a reason to act the way that they act. But we don't. Amen? When God has already called you, when he has anointed you, when he's put you in a place to bring glory to his name, and then although they knew God, they did not glorify him. They didn't honor him. They didn't say, you know, God is because of you that I'm here. You know, and, and that's where that, that anointing that he puts on your life, that, that's why he put it there. So you can bring glory to his name. Yeah. Amen. So you can bring people closer to Christ when they say, I don't know what it is about this. I don't know what it is about this 60,000 that looks better than this 65,000. I mean, come on, that's $5,000, somebody. Why is it that, that they took her 60,000 instead of that? Smelly, 65,000. Come on, somebody. That 60,000 was anointed because of where it came from. Amen? You know, it, it just, there's no, there's no logical explanation. And that's the thing. When, 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 you walk in, when you walk with that anointing, you know, when you walk with that anointing, now you'll get more done with the anointing than you will without it. What did David say? He says, I'd rather be a, a doorkeeper in the tent of my God than to dwell in the house of the wicked. One day of labor, one day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. God will advance you. Amen? Amen. But you got you to gotta cultivate that anointing. Where do you cultivate it? You know, I don't want to be these, these people. I don't want to be, I don't want to have a foolish heart. I don't want my heart to get darkened. I don't want, I don't want my thoughts to become futile. How, how, many, how many times have I heard, if I, had, if I had, you know, a quarter for every time I heard about somebody that served God and that loved God, and then all of a sudden they, they did things that just blow your mind. This person loved the Lord. You, you hear it all the time. Why? It's, it's that constant, it's that, 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 it's constant, they're valuing something else. Rather than what God has put in their heart, his purposes, his plans. You know, I, I want to read, read some more to you. Um, when you honor the anointing on your life and others, you honor the Lord. People do not honor the, the people that do not honor the Lord, they miss out on what God is doing. They miss their purpose. They miss opportunities. And they miss their breakthroughs. They miss it. If you don't believe me, turn to John chapter 5. And I'm going to show you because... In John chapter 5, here was Jesus, the anointed one, okay? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just show you just the way, just what religion is, okay? Religion, 
Religion just puts something on the outside. It looks good on the outside. It, it goes to church every week. It, it gives their tithe. It's, uh, um, you know, it, it dresses nice. It's got the nice clothes. They got the nice car. They, 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 they do nice things, but, but they missed it. And, and the people that I'm describing to you, they're the Pharisees. They're the Sadducees. And these people, they, they look good. They, they, they went to the church. They, they upkept. They, they did all of these things. But they missed Jesus that was right in front of them. I'm going to take you right here to John chapter 5. And I'm in verse 20. It's not up on the screen, so I'm not putting it up there. But it says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show, you, he, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he wills. For the Father judges no one. Okay, listen, the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. I mean, he's honored his son to do the judging. That all should honor the son just as they honor the father. Right? He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Let me ask you, if I were to ask you today, how did y'all get married? How did you get married? Who brought that man or woman into your life? Who would you say brought that man or woman to your life? Huh? You're afraid to say? The Lord brought that man or that woman into your life. He was saying, you know what? If you honored the Father, you would honor me. Whoever honors the Father, honors the Son. Let me tell you something, men. That woman that you have in your life, that's God's daughter. If you honor the daughter, you honor the Father. Amen? Yeah. Let me tell you something, women. When you honor the son, you honor the father. That man, he's really a, you know, a, man, I mean, a little boy trapped in a man's body, right? But he, if you honor your husband, you honor God. When there's honor in the house, it reflects who God is. It reflects the kingdom of God. It reflects. When, when there's honor in the church, guess what happens? It reflects the kingdom of God. There is honor. There is order. There is no chaos. There is no dishonor. There is no People trying to step on other people. There's no control. There's no manipulation. You honor because you want to honor. Not because I'll honor them if they honor me back. That's the way the world does it. Listen to what Jesus said. Verse 41. I do not receive honor from men. Whoa. But I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who, who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me, but you did not believe his writings. So how you will believe my words? He's saying the law judges you. The law judges you because that's what you believe in. You didn't believe and he prophesied about me. He spoke of me, but you don't believe him. You really don't believe him. You know, it, it's amazing how he uses that they didn't have the love of God because they didn't honor. So when we say we love, but we don't honor, how can really love be in our heart? Because it takes a person with a big heart to still honor. Amen? Amen? Honor, to me, is a synonym of humility. When you honor somebody, you highly esteem them. Amen. Sometimes we do like the, the, what the children of Israel did to Jesus. He says, they honor me with their lips, but their heart, come on, somebody. Their heart is not with me. Their heart is, their heart is hard. They honor, with, hey, brother, man, it's a blessing to see you, brother. God bless you. Right? You see, true honor comes from the heart. You know, let me tell you something. You know, if you want to know what true honor is, true honor is for whatever person that you have a hard time honoring, true honor, and I'm going to show you how Jesus did it, but true honor comes when you can defend that person. Come on. Come on. Right? If I have a hard time honoring Ray, right, and Adam starts talking about Ray, I'm going to tell Adam, hey, you know what? I really love Ray. He's doing a great job. You know what? And 
He's going to do great things in the kingdom. I'm defending his honor. I'm defending his honor. God defends the honor of those that have honor in their hearts. All right? Okay? I, I want to, and I, I want you to know this, and, and this is a, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful to what, what Christ would do. So Christ went into Simon the leper's house, right? He went in there, and you know, when, when he went in there, there was a woman. She was a, 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 a prostitute. She was an adulterer, and she came in to anoint Jesus' feet with her tears and, and, and wash them, dry them with her hair. And, and everybody wanted to shame her. Jesus defended her honor when he says, you know, because they, they all looked at Jesus and they're like, well, if he was really a prophet, if he was really this, he would know what kind of. Now, now Jesus could have just like, you know, he could have pushed her away like, hey, hey get, get away. I don't know what's wrong with this woman, guys. I'm sorry she came in here. He could have done that, you know, because it was very shameful. You know, a woman's hair was very precious. The Bible says that it is her glory, it is her crown. So when a woman used her hair, she only used it for her husband. And so when she dried Jesus' feet with her hair, she said, this is my groom. <laughs> and what did he do? He defended her honor. And he says, I came in here and you didn't even give me a drink of water. She's, you didn't even kiss me. She's been kissing me since the time she's walked in. You see, Jesus could have dishonored this man. You know how? When the man invited him to his house, he could have said, I'm not going. Those sinners. <laughs> but Jesus accepted his invitation, came into his house. Jesus still honored the man. Right? But when they try to dishonor this woman that was, that was pouring her heart out and, and honoring Jesus, she, he defended his, her honor and, and, and he started telling them, you know, hey, you know, there's, there's two guys, right? One of them had a large amount of debt and the other one had a little bit of debt. Both of them were forgiven. Who was more grateful? They said, well, the guy with all the debt. He says, that's the way it is with her. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. That's why she can love and she can honor. You see, Jesus, true honor comes when you defend somebody. It's so easy to agree with people that are gossiping about somebody. It's easy. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, I didn't really like Pastor's message Sunday either. Yeah, I don't know why he's preaching about that. It's easy, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know why those media guys take so long to get the video up. <laughs> Whoa, hit some, well, we hit some, we hit some chords there. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. God bless them, amen. <laughs> Defend them. They're doing their best. They're doing their best. You know, they got lives too. They're, they're just doing an awesome job. Think about blind Bartimaeus. Over there in Mark, I believe chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus, he was a blind man, a beggar. And Jesus was passing by, and they said that the master's walking through. And he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they said, hey, shut up already, man. Don't you see the master? Be quiet. That's what they told him. The Bible says that they told him to quiet down, to be quiet. You know what the Bible says? He said he yelled all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy. He didn't care. See, people looked at him as, as a shameful person. They, they looked at him as like, this guy's embarrassing. Jesus defended his honor. People heard, Jesus heard what all the crowd was saying about blind Bartimaeus. And you know what? He said, you know what? I'm going to stop. Call him over here. And oh, like, oh, sorry, Lord. we were telling him to shut up. We were telling him, he said, call him over here. And then they said, hey, Bartimaeus, the master's calling you. Now they want to be his friend, right? <laughs> hey, hermano, hermano, brother, he's calling you now. Come, come on, let me show you. I'll take you. <laughs> now you want to be his friend. <laughs> you know? I would have said, man, let me go, man. <laughs> I know where I'm going. I know I can hear him. That wouldn't, have, that wouldn't have been honor, brother. That wouldn't have been honor. But, you know, blind Bartimaeus and, he, and Jesus told him, what do you want me to do for you? It's obvious, right? It's obvious. 
Can you imagine that? That there's people over there talking about you, telling you to shut up, telling you this. And then Jesus, in front of everybody, says, what do you want me to do for you, Mijo? Huh? What do you want? You, 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 you want to buy a new house? You, you, you want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you just for that. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks at the people, yeah, 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 yeah. I can see now. I know who you are now. You know, he received his sight, and he was like, you're the one that told me to shut up. Yeah, I remember. But you see... But you see how beautiful Jesus' heart was? That he defended the honor. When people wanted to shame him, Jesus says, no, I want to honor them. I want to honor those that you shame. The ones that you don't like. The ones that you don't want to associate with. The ones that you don't love. And when they did something to, for God, when they did something to Christ, they did it out of their hearts. They didn't do it with their lips. The woman that washed his feet, she didn't say a word. She didn't say a word. It was her heart. Matthew chapter 8. There was a Roman centurion. And he was up here, you know, high and mighty. Had all these things. And he, his servant was so sick, he humbled himself. And he says, I got to find this Jesus how can you imagine all of these Israelites, these zealots? You know what zealots were? Zealots were, were these, these group of, of Jewish people. They couldn't stand the Romans because they were charging them so much taxes. And, and these, these zealots, they, they wanted to create a rebellion to overthrow the, Rome, the Roman people. So you imagine, those, and I think that, uh, I think Judas was really in his heart. And there was another guy that was with But But, you know, Jesus, he, he allowed this man to come in and he, and he heard him. And, the, and Jesus had so much compassion. He says, can you, you know, the, the man came and he says, my servant is sick and he's about to die. My only hope is in you, Lord. I know, I know you can do it. He says, well, let's go. I'll go. He says, no, no, no. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my roof. He's a Roman. I'm sure he was bowed down like this with his, with his helmet to his, to his heart. And, and, you know, he said, just speak the word and it'll be done. The Bible says Jesus marveled. He marveled. He marveled. Not at just his belief, his faith, but his honor. He honored God. He exalted God above every single thing. He honored the anointing. He knew that Jesus was the anointing one. You know, when blind Bartimaeus, when he said, Jesus, son of David, he was calling him the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that was to come. He, that's why when Jesus stopped, he says, man, look at this. This blind man can see better than all these other people. Just because you got eyes don't mean you got vision. Come on. Come on. Come on. The anointing gives you vision. The anointing lets you hear. The man was blind. The anointing allows you to hear. You won't miss it if you walk in the anointing, but you're not going to walk in it if you don't value it. When people value things, man, I can talk to sports fans. They can tell me every statistic from every player, how many RBIs, and they can tell me everything. They're anointed for sports, I guess. When you talk to them about the things of God, what's your purpose? What did God create you for? You know, value this anointing. Jesus said, I don't receive honor from men. And what he's saying is that, you know, the, the honor that comes from their lips, it doesn't come from their heart. And, and I love that. I, I'm gonna, I preach a message on defending your honor. <laughs> Jesus defended your honor. When I defend the honor of my wife, when somebody tries to attack her, I defend her honor. Every man should defend his, the, the honor of his wife. Amen? And, and let me tell you something, ladies, when you get to do work and all these girls are talking about how ugly men are and they're all jerks and they're all, you need to defend the honor of your husband. All men ain't like that. Come on, somebody. I got a good God-fearing man that loves me, that puts himself laugh. He puts us first. He's a good man. He loves Jesus. He takes us to church every week. He's a part of the kingdom man class. Boy, come on, somebody. You need to build him up. Let them know. She'll probably say, well, that must be an anointed man. Come on. Do he, do he got a brother? Come on, somebody. <laughs> That's the first thing they're going to ask. You got a brother? How many brothers you got? 
I need to get me one. Come on, somebody. Your sister, you're going to do something with that tongue before you get and beat them. Come on, you're going to destroy them. Amen. But you know, what are you doing? You're walking in the anointing. You're telling people all women ain't the same, all men ain't the same. God has his people. God, God can do something with you. Amen. You know, I love that. I love that. I love, I love the way the Lord works. When you honor the anointing in your life and when you honor other people's anointing. Amen. You know, other people, sometimes we don't want to honor their anointing because of something that they did or maybe the way they act. That, that's not wrong. You're hurting yourself. Yeah. Think about it. You said, well, yeah, but they're, they're corrupt. They're this. I said, well, so was Saul. David still honored the anointing that had been on his life. And David is called a man after God's own heart. I don't want to be a God after man. I don't want to be a man after God's own heart. I want to be a man after God's own hand. They just want what God can give them. If you want to truly please God and truly honor God, and you do what His Word says. David said, "I want to lift my hand against God's anointing." We're all children of God here. We all have a plan and purpose on our life, so we shouldn't talk about any of our brothers and sisters. I've been on both ends of the spectrum here. I've been on both ends. And I've seen the, the results of that. Amen? I learned to defend my brothers. Defend my sisters. Come on, somebody. Amen. So, let's be like Jesus. Jesus had a common practice of defending the honor of the outcasts, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, uh, you know, the adulterers. Imagine the woman they threw at his feet. What do you say, Lord? Stoner, right? He said, yeah, the one that has, that has no sin, let him go ahead. What did he do? He shamed them. He shamed them. He took that shame that they wanted to throw, and he, he says, that's your stuff. You're trying to shame her. You have. Man, from the oldest to the youngest, they're like, me pesco. He got me. You got me, Lord. What, what do I do? I mean, if I throw it, I'm a liar. <laughs> Everybody would have stomped. Hey, you, you, I saw you the other day. I'm going to bust you in this head. I'm bust you in the head right now with this rock. <laughs> you throw, go, go on and throw it then. Throw it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be like, man, I was just with you last week. Come on, somebody. <laughs> God is good. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Let's go. Number two, position yourself. This is number two of the anointing. Position yourself to be empty. In order, you know, to value the anointing, you have to empty yourself. If you don't empty yourself, all of those, those, those selfish and, and desires, the desires from the world, the, the, the desires of the flesh, they're, they're going to overtake you. You know, they're going to keep you in. They're going to keep you out. So, you know, position yourself to be empty. See, to be filled with the Spirit, we must be empty of self. You know, you, you got you to gotta empty yourself. So, this is the thing. To, to um, illustrate the rest of my points, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to use this story to illustrate these next two points. I got this point and one more. All right? So, this is Genesis 32, 22. It says, and... He arose. Now, I'm talking to you today about Jacob, okay? Jacob uh, did a lot of bad things in his life. And when he did all those bad things, he was running, he was doing this, he was doing that, he was conniving. He, 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 uh, he messed over his brother for the birthright, all right? He uh, stole the blessing, lied to his dad, caused a lot of havoc in the family. Then he went over to Laban, and, and Laban, uh, he wanted to, you know, take his daughters and and, you know, and, and Laban, Laban was smarter than him. He was more of a trickster than him. But, you know, he was, his wages changed. It was just a horrible life that he lived. You know, he's always, you know, he wanted one daughter, and they made him have the older daughter, and then they gave him two other, oh, man, he had, he had a lot of problems. So this is what happens. He's about to meet his brother. Him and his brother hadn't talked. They had a lot of unforgiveness toward each other. And they hadn't seen face to face. He was scared of his brother. Brother was strong. He was a hunter. And so he's about to see his brother. He just left his father-in-law. He's out on his own for the first time. He has four wives. Come on, somebody, something went wrong right there. He had four wives. 
Well, he had two wives and two maidservants, but he had a lot of kids, 11, you know. Uh, so this is where he's at. He's, he's, he's on the road, and he knows his brother's coming. So the Bible says here in 32, 22, he says, And he arose that night and took his two, two wives and his two female servants and his 11 sons. That right there ought to make you be in prayer every day. Come on, somebody. That right there alone. All right? And he crossed over the ford of Jabbok. Remember that. Jabbok. He took them and he sent them over the brook and he sent over what he had. All right? Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, the blessing and the anointing are practically almost the same. I, you know, I have some definitions here, but... To bless means to hollow or consecrate by religious right or word, to invoke divine care, to confer prosperity or happiness upon someone. It also means to hallow, to make holy, to set apart for holy use, to respect greatly. That's, bless, that's the blessing. Now, to anoint means to smear or rub with oil and to apply oil with a sacred rite, especially for consecration and setting apart unto the things of God. It means to, uh, the act of dedicating to a sacred purpose. So the blessing to me is the same as the anointing. They blessed him. They anointed him. All right. He said, I'll not let you go until you bless me. So he says here, so he said to him, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but it shall be called Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, what is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed them there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. So this is my point right here, okay? So here was Jacob. And the reason why I say you have to empty yourself for that, that blessing, that anointing, is because Jacob means it's a place. It's the Hebrew name is derived either from the root meaning to empty itself. It was a brook, and, and it would empty itself on there. So this is the thing. When you go back here... And it says that he sent them over to the brook, right? So he took all of his wives, he took all of his children, and he took all that he had. See verse 23? He sent over all that he had. He sent everything over there. And he says, I got to stay here. I got to position myself in the brook called empty because I need to empty myself of all of these things that I've been doing for so long and for so many years. He says, I need you, God. I'm about to meet my brother Esau for the first time. This is the first time that I'm out on my own. I know that I can't go without your anointing. I cannot go forward without your blessing. You see, he got rid of everything externally, but he knew there were some things internally. And so many of us, we, we, can, we can get rid of things physically. You can give that, but, but there's something in here. There's something in here. Jacob knew. He says all of the, the, this lying and this cheating and, and this conniving and, 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 and this trickery, every, all these lies I've been telling. He says, I, I, I just need you, Lord. He stayed at the brook called Empty. He stayed at the brook called Empty. He sent over what he had. And he says, Lord, empty me. And so the Bible says that Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him. Until the breaking of day. Now, this man, look, Jacob, Jacob didn't wrestle with the man. The man wrestled with Jacob. Why? Jacob was there to be emptied. <laughs> the man came to wrestle with him. He struggled with him. What was, he, what was that symbolizing? It's symbolizing that you've been resisting me for so long in your life. You've been so stubborn. You've been so hard. God wrestled with a man. God struggled with a man. Is God struggling with you? Are you, are you, are you, God has been, man, God met Jacob in the very beginning of his quest. He laid down on a rock and he showed him a ladder going to and fro from heaven. And, and Jacob's been going the opposite way of God. He's been, God's been trying to get his attention just like God has been trying to get your attention. 
And he went in there and he, and he struggled. He struggled with Jacob. You know, Jacob wasn't trying to do anything. But, but you know, he kept struggling with this. And, and look at it. It said, that, it said that he struggled all night. That's a long time for God to be struggling. That's a long night. And the man wrestled with him, you see, because he arose that night and took his two wives at night. And then it says down here that he, that Jacob was left alone and wrestled until the breaking of day. All night. I mean, three minutes in the ring is long enough for me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I remember when I went boxing when I was a kid, and, 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 and I went the first round. And I was, <gasps> and the guy said, ding. I said, hey, man, hey. <laughs> he said, no, you got to go. I said, look, if you see me back out there, I'm going to get beat up. I told him, I'm serious. I was a kid, and, and he's like, you got to go. I said, look, if you send me back, I'm going to get beat up. I'm tired. I can't go, man. <laughs> he wrestled all night. God was trying to strip him. And when God, look, let me tell you something. This sounds crazy. The Bible says that God couldn't prevail. And when you look at your own life, is God prevailing in your life? Or do you stay with that thick skull and you keep saying I'm going to do it my way I'm going to do it the way I want to do it I, I got this I, I've come this far Lord I, I can do it on my own this is and, and the Bible says that when, when, when he couldn't prevail the Bible says he touched the hip of his socket and there's a muscle there in the hip of your socket that shrunk that's why the children of Israel they don't eat that 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 meat of that what is that what is that he took away his strength some of us God has to take away our strength you get to the place to where you're weary you're tired you, you, you don't you don't you know you're like I, I can't go on anymore you, you got to get to that place in your life where you just cry out to God Lord I need you you see God tapped him on that muscle that muscle strength he took away his strength but it still wasn't done it still wasn't done you know Jacob he, even though he took away his strength you know, Jacob didn't feel no different. Some of you, you come up here and, and, and there's people that lay hands on you and you say, they ask you, do you feel different? No, I still feel the same. You see, people can pray for you. But if you don't open up your mouth and you confess the things that you know you need to confess. Finally, the guy says, the man says, let me go. And Jacob says, I can't, not until you bless me, not until you anoint me, not until you give me. I came here to be emptied, and I'm not fully emptied yet. I know I still got these same things. And then that's when he told him, he said, what's your name? What is your name? You see, because his name said it all. His name said swindler, supplanter conniver his name said he said your name he says what, what would it, what it got God wanted the confession he wanted him to take responsibility for what he's been when you take responsibility for what you've been see God didn't want to let him go until he could leave that stuff and be emptied so when he said my name is Jacob the Bible says he said what is your name he said Jacob he said your name shall no longer be called Jacob but Israel, one with God, God's people. He said you should be called Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. What do you mean you have struggled with God and men and have prevailed? What does he mean he struggled with men? What men? Struggle with Esau, struggle with Isaac, struggle with Laban, struggle with all of these men and prevailed. He took Esau's birthright. He lied to his father, and his father gave him the blessing. He struggled with men, and he struggled with God, and he prevailed. Why? His confession. Which brings me, he says, May, my name, he said he blessed him there, so Jacob called the name Peniel. He gave him another name. So which brings me to the last point, and that is receive the anointing. You have to learn to receive the anointing in your life. If you don't ever receive, what, what happened? He received that name Israel. For his life and today when we talk about the children of Israel we're talking about Jacob but no longer do we call him swindler liar you see God is trying to change your name 
God wants to change your name. You're no longer that same person you used to be. God wants you to be a different person. God has called you by name. He's given you a name. He's anointed you. He's appointed you. And, and you, you know, sometimes you want to go back and say, just call me Jacob. Amen. <laughs> receive the anointing. You have to honor it. You have to be emptied and you have to receive. If you never receive the anointing in your life and you never walk in it, when people say, man, you know, you know, uh, the Lord's calling you to preach. No, not me. Don't, no, don't tell me that. I mean, you're just like, no, reject it. What they see in you is not you. It's God. Amen? Don't reject, don't reject the, the gifts and the anointing that God has given you. Walk in them. Amen? Hallelujah. Let me see. I'm going I'm to close with that. Jacob finally admitted to who he really was to God. Have you admitted who you really are? Have you taken the responsibility of your actions? Everything was wrapped up in his name, which became his identity. And I don't know what your identity has been, but God wants to take, change your identity. The devil has stolen your identity, and he's trying to give it to you back because God created you for a purpose. Amen? Amen. Come on, stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. How many of you truly received that word this morning? I mean, you know, you know, we can talk. We can talk in here. I mean, I can talk in here about things that I feel that people want to hear. And I can you know, do stuff that I know that uh, just to, you see, for me, it's not, it's not just about gaining people to a church. That, that's not what it's about for me. You know, I want you to know the truths of God. I want you to, I want you to go out and be transformed. You see, that, that encounter with God, it transformed him. You know, I, there was a fourth, fourth point that I couldn't get to, but number, just number four, just to let you know, the fourth thing to walking in the anointing is dependency. Dependency on God. Throughout your life, God wants you to stay dependent on Him and not who you are and not what you can do. He wants you to be 100, 100, totally dependent on who He is and what He's able to bring and provide in your life. That, that's, that's number four. And, and that one right there is one of the hardest, especially for us men. Because we're the providers and we try to work the things and we try to, you know, we, 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 got, we got to try to do things on our own. But, but God is saying, just, just depend on me. Trust me. Stay connected to me. Come see me in the morning. I want to I wanna do more for you than you can do for yourself. You know, can you just, just bow your heads this morning? And Father God, I just, Father, I just exalt thee. I just exalt thee in this place, Lord. I know, Father, I know. I know this is your word and not mine, Lord. I know, Father, that I don't, I don't desire anything else but to bring your word, Father, in the fullness. And, Father, I just declare over your people today, Father, for those that are here, Lord, that have been, they've been struggling. You've been struggling with them. They, a lot of them want it. They want your heart. They want your change, Lord. But they continue to, to not just let go, Lord. And I pray, Father, that they won't let go of you until you bless them, until they come to that realization, Father, of, of what you're trying to do in their lives, Lord. And so, Father God, I pray for everyone here today, Lord, that, that they will no longer just ignore the anointing, that they will not ignore your calling and your voice on their life, Lord. And I pray, Father, that we would value it, Lord. That we would pursue it, Father. That we would answer the call of God on our lives, Lord. And that we won't, that, that, that we won't just listen to the things in this world, but we would be empty of those things, Lord. I pray today, Father, that you would empty all the junk, all the hurt, all the pain from our past, Lord. If you're here today and you say, I know I need to be empty. If that's you, I want you to just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. Empty me. Empty me, Lord. 
for my own selfish desires. Not my will, Lord, but let your will be done in my life. I don't want to leave this place until you empty me. And today, Lord Jesus, I want to move forward with your anointing, with your blessing, with your love, with your peace, with your joy in my life, Lord. And today, Lord, I release any hurt, unforgiveness, burden, or any kind of resentment. I release it to you, Lord. And I've done wrong, and I ask you to forgive me. I receive your love, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your ministering angels in this place, Lord. Thank you for ministering to us, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I want you to know that God saw you. God saw you and God heard you. God saw you and God heard you. And it's time for you to walk into your purpose. God has changed some things in your life, some desires that you've desired. God has said he, he's taken them away. No longer will you desire the same things. It doesn't mean that they won't be there. They'll be there. But he said he'd taken away the desire. Jacob didn't have a desire to lie anymore. Jacob didn't have a desire to that. He was a good man. He had his boys. He loved his kids. And he went on to do great things. And God is saying that now it's time for you to go on and do great things. Amen. Father God, we just thank you today. We honor you. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your word. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.